This is rental car number 138. Today I'm driving the 2020 Chevy Spark 1 LT. So I got this one for 850 enterprise points and a total of $2.49. And believe me, it was worth every single penny. Before we get started, I just want to say this is right in my wheelhouse. I love small, fuel-efficient, practical budget cars like this. So I was pretty excited to take this one for a spin. I think it's worth noting that this car has been made since 1998, which I found pretty shocking. It was debuted in South Korea by Daewoo Motors. Daewoo was eventually absorbed by GM, but throughout all the corporate mergers and name changes, they kept making this vehicle. And it's gaining quite a bit of popularity now in the States, and I think I get it because... It's pretty affordable. The base model of the Spark starts at about $13,000, and uh, this one you see in front of you is $14,595, which it's not a whole lot of money for the amount of car you get with this thing. All right, let's talk specs for a second. Under the hood, you have a 1.4 liter inline four cylinder engine. This has a two speed continuously variable transmission with overdrive, that's a CVT. Not a whole lot of horsepower, only 98, but it's at 6,200 RPMs. And because you get a lack of power, you get some pretty good gas mileage. 30 miles per gallon in the city, 38 on the highway with a 33 combined rating. And those are from the EPA, if you're curious. And only a 9 gallon fuel tank, which I found kind of surprising. But it's a good thing, because gas by me right now in January of 2020 is about $2.89 a gallon. So if you fill this thing up, you're only going to spend about 26 bucks, which ain't too bad. Here's the key. It's got Chevy's logo on the back. Ooh, a couple of buttons on the front. Unlock, lock, and a panic button. Let's try the panic button so we can hear what the horn sounds like. There we go. And then there's a small button right here to flip out the key. Let's start her up. steering wheel setup is pretty simple. On the left hand side we have our cruise controls. On the right hand side we have buttons to answer and hang up phone calls. Uh, toggle switch to select things in the center display. And then a volume rocker right here to adjust the volume. Let's turn that off. Sounds like I turned the radio on by pressing this button. Uh, the gauge cluster is accented in a nice turquoise. Over here on the left hand side we have our fuel gauge then RPMs, speedometer in the middle, and you'll see the cruise control indicator light right there. And then a small screen right here that you can adjust just a little bit. The P is for park, 42, 47 on the bottom, that's my odometer. And then we have a small area right here that we can uh, change by adjusting this little switch on the stock. So we have our average miles per hour. I haven't been going that fast. We have 300, oh, excuse me, 238 miles until we're empty. We have our uh, trip counter. And then I think this is really interesting, but you actually have a stopwatch. And you can adjust it by pushing this button right here to start it, stop it, or reset it. Over on the left-hand side, standard controls to lock and unlock the doors, adjust the windows, and adjust the side view mirrors. You also have uh, kind of a dull plastic latch right here to open and close the door. Up on the dash we have our traction control button, a dial to adjust the headlights, and then another dial to adjust the brightness of the display up here in the gauge cluster. Side view mirrors, pretty small, but you know, this is a tiny car, so you don't really need a big size mirror. And you get the same mirror also on the passenger side. Up top, a small control panel area with just one switch to adjust whether the lights are going to turn on, off, or if they're going to turn on and off as you open and close the door. You have OnStar buttons and a panic button right here. Rear view mirror, pretty simple. Nothing except the toggle switch on the back. Down below there we have our touch screen. Pretty nice considering the uh, how expensive this car is, and you do get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto automatically loaded onto the vehicle. You know, with these vehicles, the only thing I do is connect my phone via Bluetooth, and that was pretty simple. I was able to connect my phone within, you know, I don't know, 30 seconds, which is pretty nice, especially for a rental car. You also have dedicated buttons down here to jump to the home screen, adjust the volume, or turn the system on or off. Let's keep it off because 
uh, I don't like the radio station Enterprise picked for me. And then a phone button right here. This is not uh, amazing, but uh, you know, for a 2020, this is pretty good, especially for the cost of this vehicle. Nice colors, it's very responsive. Let's turn that off. And you do have a temperature gauge down here. It's 27 degrees out right now. A clock and then an indicator to show whether or not your phone is connected via Bluetooth or if you have Wi-Fi enabled. Neither of those is enabled for me. That's why they're grayed out. And then let's check out the navigation menu. You can see this small green plus arrow down here. Um, my only complaint with this is it seems like it's all set up to only be accessible using OnStar. So let me show you. I'm just going to place, uh, we're going to do home directions. Look at that. It's, OnStar. It's calling OnStar. I do not want to call OnStar. Let's try an address voice search. Again, we are OnStar. calling OnStar. I do not want to call OnStar. I just want to interact with the screen itself. It doesn't seem like that's available, um, at least how it's set up right now. So that's a little bit disappointing. Let's go back to the home screen. Still, nice icons, nice colors, really responsive screen, and, and a decent size. So, all in all, this is okay in my opinion. Down below there, we have a nice big hazard button, two large vents, and then your climate controls, a dial to adjust the temperature, a dial to adjust the fan, and then a dial to adjust the direction that the vents are blowing. Below there, we have storage cutout. That's where I've been keeping my phone. And further down below, I can move my cup out of the way. You can see we have two USB ports, right? Old fashioned and new, and also a power port right there. Two cup holders behind there, and then the gear shift. Uh, made out of plastic, but you know what? Shift of the gears pretty smoothly. And I forgot to mention, when you shift the car into reverse, you do get a backup camera. It's a little bit grainy, but it's a big screen, and you can see what's going on behind you fairly easily. And then you do have some guides. That's the uh, red and orange right there. That'll show you where you're going to maneuver the car as you're steering. Behind there, let's move my cup again. We have a manual parking brake. A couple of small storage cutouts. And an armrest for the driver. You'll notice there is no centered console right here for any storage. On the passenger side, we have a small cutout. I don't think it's gonna be super useful though because there's no lip here. So if you were to maybe keep something there, I bet it's gonna slide out if you brake or accelerate pretty hard. And then your glove box down below, full of uh, registration materials, owner's manual, whatever that is. And then some extra, I'm gonna guess, license plate screws maybe? Pretty small size, but uh, as you saw, it, it, gets, it gets everything you need in there, and then a little bit more. Last thing I want to touch on is visibility out of the rear window. When those headrests are up, it cuts into your visibility quite a bit. When they're down, uh, you can see pretty well. My only concern is that in the corners, you know, you got those large plastic pieces that block visibility, so seeing someone in your blind spot is going to be a bit of a challenge in this vehicle. All right, I jumped in the back seat. I'm six feet tall, and I kept the driver's seat pushed back a comfortable distance, and uh, as you'll notice, I barely, barely fit in the back seat. Both my knees and my shins are touching the seat itself, and my feet are actually under the seat. So this is super uncomfortable, but I do fit, although I'm guessing the driver is gonna feel my knees pushing against their back. Let me, uh, let me adjust this seat so that I can be a little bit more comfortable back here. All right, so I pushed the seat forward about three or four inches, which is gonna make it uncomfortable for me to drive, but at least I fit back here. So I guess if you have a shorter driver, then uh, maybe an adult can sit back here comfortably. Not a whole lot of amenities back here for your passengers. No pocket on the back of the driver's seat, but you do get a pocket on the pass the on the back of the passenger seat, and this is kind of a synthetic-like material. It has a little bit of give to it. Uh, as I mentioned before, no center armrests. There's no power ports or anything down here. On the door, you just have a window control, door lock, and a door latch. And then up top, there's no handle, but you do get a small hook for a jet. There's no center armrest, but you do get a small cutout down here, a place to store maybe a cell phone and then a single drink holder. And then car seat anchors. 
they're pretty shallow. I don't know if you can tell, but you can already see it right here. And that's a good sign, because that means it's that much easier to connect a car seat back here, which is a big plus in my book. When these anchors are buried deep, it just makes installing car seats really difficult, and there's no reason for that. So thankfully, the Spark has done a nice job with the car seat anchors. All right, so let's open up the hatch and take a look at the storage space on the Spark. This is with those rear seats folded up, and you still get enough room for maybe a suitcase or two or your groceries. It's pretty good. Underneath the floor of this area, there is a spare tire, and it's actually pretty easy to get access to, which I was impressed with. And these rear seats do fold down if you need some more room, but they're not exactly easy to manipulate. So it actually took me a little bit of time to figure out how to do this. It's, it goes in three stages. The first thing you have to do is pull the seat cushion forward with a pretty good amount of force and it pops open and folds forward. Then you can fold the rear seats down, but before you actually put them all the way down, you have to remove the headrests. And you have to remove the headrests when the rear seats are folded about halfway, because otherwise you won't have enough clearance room from the ceiling to actually remove the headrests. So once you remove the headrests, then you can fold those rear seats down all the way if, and if, you have pushed the front seats forward a good six inches from where you probably will keep them. I'm kind of complaining right now because it, it was kind of a pain in the butt, but honestly, once you do it once or twice, it's really not that bad. My first attempt probably took me five, ten minutes, uh, but after I practiced once or twice, you could probably do it in about 30 seconds, which, which isn't too bad. But, you know, once you get it all set up, you do actually have a decent amount of storage room back here to haul around some larger items. And that's why I love hatchbacks so much, because they are pretty versatile and practical. All right, but enough with the hatch. Let's talk about what it's actually like to drive this vehicle. And I want to start with acceleration. Now, remember, you only have 98 horsepower, so don't expect this thing to be the fastest car on the road. But it does have a little bit of pickup. I mean, enough to make it, you know, kind of a fun car to drive. I would recommend, though, if you are going from something fast and powerful to the Spark, to give yourself some time to get used to it, because it is not a quick vehicle. Um, but where it does shine is handling. You have really small tires, only 15-inch wheels, and you have a small car in general, so cornering is just amazing. At slower speeds, you really do feel like you're driving in a go-kart, and parking it is just fantastic, because it's so easy to maneuver. At higher speeds, I, I felt comfortable, but not so much that I felt like I could push it around a long corner. I was just a little worried that it, the back end was gonna slip out on me. And that was just a general feeling. Nothing actually happened, but that's just the vibe I got from driving this car. So handling is fantastic at lower speeds. At higher speeds it works, but you know, it's not a sports car, so don't expect to be able to do some really, really speedy corners. Cabin noise is, it's okay. You know, even at lower speeds, you really do hear the wind rustling through the cabin. And I did notice I had to bump up the volume a little bit on what I was listening to so that I could make out the words in my audiobook. But it wasn't horrible. And uh, honestly, pretty good overall, considering the price point of this vehicle. All right, so that's pretty much everything end-to-end -end on the 2020 Chevy Spark 1LT got to keep in mind what this vehicle is and I'm saying this before I get to my rating right it is a small low-cost fuel efficient vehicle not a performance sports car so with that being said I'm gonna give this one four stars look there is a lot a lot to love about the Chevy Spark my only criticism and it's a minor one is that 38 miles per hour on the highway with something this small that really isn't that good. I wish it would be more like in the 40s, but that's just me, and I really do value fuel economy, so that's why I'm giving it four stars. But anyway, if you disagree, I would love to hear from you. Please leave me a comment below, and we can chat about the spark. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you join me next time when I rent and review my 139th rental car. I'll see you then.